Hi everybody, this is Dr. Eklund from Sweden and today I will talk about CDG and epilepsy. And I'm a pediatric neurologist working in the southern part of Sweden. Um, and this talk is mainly uh, the same as the one I um, presented at the family conference in San Diego earlier this year. And this is a favorite girl of mine. This is Ella, who suffered from very severe epilepsy. And she will be joining us uh, uh, on our journey today. She's going to be sort of the red thread throughout this lecture. And this is Ella's EEG, which is showing a very severe pattern, uh, almost like a thunderstorm. You can see periods of violent electric discharges mixed with periods of almost complete silence, a pattern that we refer to as hips arrhythmia. And we'll come back to this later in the lecture. So what is epilepsy? We have to define it and we have to define seizures and how they are related. Because seizures and epilepsy are not the same. Uh, an epileptic seizure is a transient occurrence of signs or symptoms due to abnormal, excessive, synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. Epilepsy, on the other side, is a disease characterized by an enduring predisposition to generate epileptic seizures. So, a seizure is an event, and epilepsy is the disease involving recurrent unprovoked seizures. Uh, the old definition of epilepsy said that having two unprovoked seizures with a minimum of 24 hours in between means that you have epilepsy. Today this definition has changed a little bit, a little more hard to understand. So today you have epilepsy if you've had one unprovoked seizure and the doctor appreciates the risk that you will have another one, uh, that that risk is more than 60%. So, uh, during an epileptic seizure, a patient can present a multitude of different symptoms, uh, depending on which part of the brain is being affected. And this is what we call the semiology of the seizure. And there are many medical terms that are sometimes hard to grasp. So I'm, I will be trying to explain different terms and what they really mean uh, in lay language. So we talk about automatisms, uh, which are automatic unconscious behaviors such as chewing. So when you hear the word automatisms, that means that the patient has an automatic behavior. It can also be stereotypies that you move your hands in a, in a, in a very stereotypic way. We can also talk about tonic seizures. And a tonic seizure is when the patient uh, end up in an extension or flexion posture with stiffening of the muscles. So there is no movement. It's stiff and either extended or flexed. You can have autonomic seizures such as flushing, sweating, pyroerection, and other um, types of, of bodily reactions that we, we collectively call autonomic. Uh, you can have an absence seizure in which there is a sudden loss of consciousness, uh, which uh, for the patient uh, makes the, the, the world be chopped up in pieces because they sometimes disappear and the world continues on. And, and when they come back to, to their uh, consciousness, uh, they have lost a bit of time. Uh, you can have myoclonic or myoclonus, which is a rhythmical jerking. It's the same feeling you might get when you are falling asleep and you want to uh, hold on. So everyone once in a while experience myoclonic uh, attacks. That does not mean you have epilepsy. You can have a clonic seizure, which on the other hand, compared to the myoclonus, is a rhythmical jerking. 
So you get this type of seizures where you have a rhythmical jerking, usually arms or legs. Uh, you can have eyelid myoclonia where you get jerks of the eyelids, which should not be uh, mistakenly taken for ticks. Uh, you can have atonic seizures in, in which there is a sudden loss of muscle tone uh, so that you cannot, for instance, stand up. You will fall down and you might actually hurt yourself quite badly. You can have sensation seizures where you get a sensation and numbness or a tingling. You can hear a sound, smell a smell taste a specific taste you can see visions and you can feel vertigo and there is also a very specific term called spasms which is a a seizure that is shorter than a myoclonus and it's longer uh, than a um, tonic seizure uh, where the trunk flexes and the arms are extended which is part of a syndrome we will talk a little bit about it's called the west syndrome uh, in which you have the EEG I showed uh, recently, the, the uh, hips arrhythmia. So, so just a short correction. A spasm is longer than a myoclonus and shorter than a tonic seizure. I think I was wrong in the previous slide. Now, when you try to classify different types of seizures, we also look at where they start and how they propagate. And this is based on the International League Against Epilepsy's classification from 2017. And when we have a patient in front of us, we try to determine whether the seizure has what we call a focal onset, which means that it starts in one place in the brain and might spread from there, or if it has a generalized onset, which means that the whole brain, or at least both sides of the brain, are engaged from the beginning of the seizure. And then we look at the semiology that we went through beforehand and try to characterize them after what type of seizure you get. So first focal or generalized, and then we look at the semiology. One powerful way uh, of investigating suspected epilepsy is doing a so-called EEG or an electroencephalogram. And with this method, you place several electrodes uh, on the head of the patient, and these electrodes will then pick up the electric signal generated in the cortex of the brain just beneath the electrode. The EEG can be used in many ways. You can do a long-term monitoring if you have very few epileptic uh, seizures and you want to catch them you can have an EEG ongoing for several days and you carry with you the the, the recording equipment in a, in a backpack you can do uh, a surgical investigation where you actually operate uh, the electrodes in so you can get a deeper recording than just on the surface of the brain or you can just do a routine EEG for a short term on an awake patient to see whether you have signs or not of, of epilepsy. And this is what you get. This is a normal EEG in a neonate. The orange lines represent the left side of the brain and the blue lines represent the right side of the brain. And here you can see the normal changes in the electrical currents uh, of the brain, but it looks uh, not very sharp and it looks look it looks very normal so this is what a normal EEG would look like in a very young child and um, this on the other hand uh, is an EEG where you see sharp waves mainly on the left side so the orange lines uh, and it represents a left-sided focal epileptic activity something we call interictal activity which means that the patient has an increased risk of having seizures from the left side, but that we haven't recorded any actual seizures. So this is the interictal representation of left-sided um, discharges. This, on the other hand, is what I showed you before. This is hips arrhythmia, where you have electrical storms on both sides, and all of a sudden you get what we call attenuation. So it becomes almost 
quiet as I'm trying to show you here in the middle and then you get these electrical storms again. This is epileptic encephalopathy. So this is a really, really severely affected EEG. And I will now try and show you a couple of seizures in a PMM2 patient uh, who has quite uh, hard to treat epilepsy. And you see here that the right arm is having a tonic extension, a little bit of shaking, and also that the right leg is shaking. And you see that his eyes are fixed to the left. And in another seizure in the same patient, you see that both legs are now engaged and shaking, and mainly the right arm, whereas the left arm is almost paretic. So what do we know about epilepsy in CDG? Well, we know that it has been described in most CDG subtypes. So there are very few subtypes where no patients have experienced epilepsy. Sometimes, quite often, for instance, in PMM CDG, uh, it is manageable with anti-seizure drugs. So if the patient gets appropriate treatment, it constitutes a minor problem. We also know that in patients where you have severe epilepsy, this occurs in conjunction with other severe neurological symptoms, such as pronounced muscular hypotonia, ataxia, or severe intellectual disability. There are no published treatment guides as to which anti-seizure drug you should use. So we can mainly base this on published case descriptions and case series. And this is one example from two years back when Bobby uh, and Hud and colleagues uh, uh, went through 29 patients with ALG13 CDG and looked at their clinical descriptions, but also looked specifically at which anti-seizure drugs seem to work. And we could conclude in this paper that if the patient has spasms, a, a, a treatment with cortisone or ACTH was better than vigabatrin. We could show that ketogenic diet might work and that the anti-seizure drugs felbamate and clobazam were very interesting, but only used in a few patients. So this is pretty much the type of data that exists out there when it, it when it comes to the different subtypes so why does patients with cdg develop epilepsy to be frank we don't know the exact mechanisms but probably there are many different reasons uh, in a recent review by stephanie grunewald and colleagues they delineated two main different types of mechanisms that underlie epilepsy in these patients uh, and i will call these the molecular and the structural mechanisms. In the molecular explanation, which might be reversible, which is of course interesting when we uh, talk about potential treatments in CDD, uh, one can see a disturbed balance between excitatory and the inhibitory uh, neuronal activity uh, due to improper function of, for instance, voltage-gated iron channels. Uh, within the cell membrane, uh, and also defective glycosylation of signal transducers such as uh, receptors. Uh, and you can see here in the depiction uh, that you either have problems with the glycosylation uh, in, in these type of channels that convey irons from the outside of the cell to the inside, and these channels are really important to convey the electric signals going from one neuron to the other. So if these ones don't work, there might be a problem with the signal going here. And 
it can be a signal going too slow and if this is an inhibiting neuron trying to block a signal and the signal goes too slow you might develop a seizure or the signal goes too quickly or too many signals come this way and you will excite the other cells to produce a, a seizure or if we look at the synapse between two neurons so this is where the nerve impulse comes in and it's turned into a chemical signal in the synapse uh, or the synaptic cleft where chemicals will be released from the nerve uh, impulse and transverse the synapse to the <coughs> to the receiving cell where ion channels will be activated and a new nerve impulse will continue if there is a problem with the glycosylation of these molecules involved here that might also interact and disturb the signal and cause a seizure so the other explanation which i call a structural explanation which might not be reversible since these are usually damages that have occurred to the brain already in utero uh, you can see in some subtypes um, neuronal migration disorders uh, such as in omanosylation disorders uh, or you can see the result after a stroke or a stroke-like episode which creates an area of the brain that contains an increased potential for uh, in, in instigating or initiating uh, a focal epileptic uh, activity another question one asks oneself is why are some subtypes more affected than others and the uh, short rather boring answer is we don't know it could be that certain types of mesglycosylation actually causes epilepsy it could be that certain glycogenes that are mutated in different subtypes actually have other functions that are also involved in, in epilepsy but there is no clear answer to why certain subtypes have more and more severe epilepsy than others uh, and hopefully we will figure out this in the future so now going back to Ella who I said would be the red thread of this lecture so in Ella's background this is a girl whose parents were from Syria they were real or true cousins and they were part of an Assyrian Christian minority uh, she had an older sister that succumbed in Syria at 12 months of age. Uh, she was diagnosed with something called Cockaine's disease, which involves microcephaly, retinal dystrophy, severe intellectual disability, growth impediment, and severe epilepsy due to de novo mutations. This was, however, later re-evaluated back here in Sweden, and we uh, decided that these were not the causing mutations of this sister's disease so when Ella was born uh, in Sweden she was born after a normal pregnancy and the delivery was normal at term she was a bit jittery and had an early EEG uh, which was completely normal and at six days she was uh, once again examined by a pediatrician who found the examination examination completely normal uh, at three months she was deemed delayed uh, it was also said that she was somewhat hypotonic and hard to get uh, a an eye contact with uh, at four months she presented with failure to thrive she was still very muscularly hypotonic and lacked uh, clearly uh, eye contact so one asked the question whether she had severe visual problems at six months still being hypotonic and not gaining weight ex as expected uh, she was able to discriminate between light and darkness but otherwise she was almost not uh, seeing anything and uh, liver pathology was revealed with a 3x increase in, in ALT and 1.5x increase in AST. So there was a suspicion of a genetic disorder. And these days, the investigation usually continues with a whole genome sequencing, which was ordered. And uh, at seven months, she got seizures. Uh, she turned her head and her eyes to the left and then had tonic 
going to clonic movements in the arms. EEG showed an epileptic encephalopathy, uh, and the M MRI of the brain was normal, and she was started on the anti-seizure drug levetiracetam. But that didn't work, so she also got phenobarbital. And an EEG at that time uh, showed severe pathology. Uh, you can appreciate here the storms again of electric activity. And in between that, you have the attenuation recognized as hips arrhythmia. Uh, we can also refer to this as epileptic encephalopathy, which means that the epilepsy per se causes uh, brain pathology. So not only the underlying cause, not only the CDG, but also the actual epileptic activity affects her cognitive and motor development. There was also done an analysis of transferrin, which revealed a type 1 pattern, uh, showing an increase uh, in underglycosylated um, transferrin, both A-glycosylated and monoglycosylated. And when the genome came back, uh, it revealed uh, homozygous point mutation in DPAGT1, um, and this uh, had previously been described in compound heterozygous state in a patient with myasthenic DPAGT1 disease, but never as a homozygous mutation. And as you know, DPAGT1 encodes the first step where an n glucosamine is transferred onto the dolichol phosphate uh, lipid anchor. And this actually interestingly sits in a hotspot for severe epilepsy together with dolichol kinase deficiency, ALG13 and ALG1 uh, deficiency. And DPA-GT1 CDD was first published in 2003 by Dr. Wu in the lab of Hudson Fries. Uh, and there are presently less than 50 published cases. And there are interestingly two distinguishable phenotypes, one with a very severe, with early onset epilepsy, severe intellectual disability, muscular hypotonia, and a very high mortality. And there is also one with more mild features with myasthenic, so fatigable muscles, uh, but near normal uh, cognition. So back to Ella. Uh, and despite addition of several anti-seizure drugs, such as levetiracetam, phenobarbital, clobazam, vigabatrine, lamotrigine, and topiramat, the seizures continued unchanged. And because we had now looked at ALG13 patients in the cohort I mentioned beforehand, we knew that a ketogenic diet might be beneficial, so that was started. Uh, Ella had developed what we refer to as drug-resistant epilepsy. And this is defined as an uncontrolled seizure situation, despite at least having two syndrome-adapted anti-seizure drugs used at efficacious uh, daily doses. Uh, and the probability of seizure freedom after two uh, ASDs have failed decreases exponentially and is less than 5% after four failures. So that's why you call it drug resistant already after you have tried two drugs that haven't worked. About one third of all epilepsy patients develop drug resistant uh, epilepsy. And risk factors include early onset, intellectual disability, and abnormal neurological uh, exams. So when you're in this situation of having a, a drug-resistant epilepsy, there are several interventions that could be explored that are not uh, directly using anti-seizure drugs. Um, the first is epileptic surgery, where you try and locate an area of the brain that causes these seizures and, and remove that. Uh, and in CDG, that is usually hard because you often have what we call multifocal epilepsy or generalized epilepsy. And then you can't really locate an area that causes all the, uh, the seizures and therefore you cannot remove that. You can use a ketogenic diet, which is a diet that is uh, 
very, very high in fat and very, very low in carbohydrates. Uh, and that is usually uh, a good thing to try when you have drug resistant epilepsy because it can cause both seizure freedom or a better seizure situation, but also increase cognition for the patient. And on the plus side, uh, you also often have a persisting effect after stopping the diet. On the negative side, uh, this might be a difficult to tolerate type of diet in older patients. It is quite work intensive for the families. Uh, in many patients, there are intestinal side effects, both to get loose stools and to get uh, constipation. Uh, and it might be really hard to maintain during infections. And this is an example what a ketogenic diet can look like. So it's not always displeasing to look at. This is a pancake omelet with raspberries, which, well, I could fancy having this dish, definitely. Um, we know that KD sometimes works. Uh, as I said previously, in the ALG13 uh, CDD cohort, we found several patients that had tried it and that actually had rather good seizure control from it. There is something called a vagus nerve stimulation, which can be used if you have drug-resistant epilepsy. And with this type of uh, therapy for seizures, you get a pulse generator uh, inoperated, and this is hooked up to the vagus nerve, which is normally a nerve that sends signals from the brain to the body, controlling, for instance, heart rate. But there are also neurons going the other direction, and you can send pulses via this nerve um, to control seizures. Uh, this works in some patients, but there are no bigger studies, and especially not in, in CDD patients. So there are only case reports that vagus nerve stimulation can be an alternative. Uh, but it should definitely be investigated if you have a patient with really severe epilepsy and you've tried the other types of, of treatment. And of course, when you have drug-resistant epilepsy, the new disease-modulating compounds should be tried, uh, such as galactose in, in galactotransport deficiency, aparostat in PMM2CD, and so forth. And we will hear much more of this uh, in the upcoming uh, months and years. Uh, for instance, uh, in the paper of 2020, uh, looking at SLC35A2 patients, uh, one could see that epilepsy improved on galactose in an 18-week trial. So back uh, to Ella. Uh, she spent most of her time in the hospital. She had a short passing effect of ketogenic diet together with an aggressive anti-seizure drug treatment, including leproic acid, felbamate, phenytoin, magnesium, pretty much any known anti-epileptic drug. And she was repeatedly treated in the PICU with propofol sedation just to get a short relief of these very severe um, seizures. In June of 2021, she attracted COVID and she got severe lung insufficiency. And she was treated for three weeks, intubated at the PICU, uh, but it was realized that she would not survive this lung uh, insufficiency in the context of her very severe seizures. So she was transferred to the neurological ward for palliative care. And this shows Ella uh, two days before she died and gained her angel wings. Uh, she's being Christianed because her parents realized they hadn't had time to do that in her whole a life being hospitalized almost from six months of age until she passed. So now we reached uh, the take home messages of this short lecture. Epilepsy is common in CDD syndromes where some subtypes are more prone to severe or as we call it intractable disease uh, than others. In many patients, the epilepsy treatment may have to include both anti-seizure drugs and other non-pharmacological interventions such as a ketogenic diet or vagus nerve stimulation. 
and there is a great need for structured studies on characteristics and treatment responses in individual subtypes because there is a lack of specific guidelines for epilepsy and CDG that can be used by clinicians and hopefully future research can provide such guidelines. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, some people uh, that I've been working with over the years. Um, first of all, the patient's families that gave me the, the um, right to use pictures and tell their stories. Um, Professor Tom de Koenig and M. Fiora Bukai back here in Sweden that formed the CDG team in Lund. And uh, most, of course, Hud and Bobby, uh, who I have a continuous, very nice collaboration with over the, at least the last 20 years. And here is an old picture where you can see a very young Hudson Fries and myself outside a random restaurant in, in San Diego. Um, 20 years ago. So thanks so much for listening and have a, a great day. Cheers.